Hello, I'm John Nightingale, a director at JCT and the symposium host. Now the 25th JCT Traffic Signal Symposium was an online event this year and I'm delighted to bring you a recording of one of the presentations. Now these recordings would not have been possible without the support of a select group of our event partners. So our thanks go to the Institute of Highway Engineers, ITS UK, keepadistance.co.uk, Siemens Mobility, TWM, and of course, our media partner, Highways News. Please check out their short videos, which will tell you about some of the products and services that they can provide. Now, I hope you enjoy this presentation, and we would love to see you in person for our 25th anniversary event in Nottingham Trent University in September 2021. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Over the last couple of years, I have validated a number of junctions where there's been a disconnect between the design of the junction and how Scoot works. So I thought it might be useful to just go through some design principles um, that might help in, with people that are not familiar with Scoot with, in terms of um, things to be aware of when you're designing a junction that's gonna ultimately run on Scoot control. So I'm gonna jump straight in with cycle times because there's quite a lot of material to cover and, uh, and there's only a few minutes. So. And the way that the scoop model works is that when you are um, looking to run a common cycle time across your network in order to get offsets, the only way you can make those offsets work is if you're running that common cycle time. And this is a real problem and quite restrictive in the scoop model because when you design a site, you tend to design in Linstig, work out what your staging order needs to be, what your cycle times need to look like, and then the junction is, is built and, and put into the ground. But does that actually match to the requirement of the junctions that are already there? Has that comparison been done? And we need to consider factors like whether your queuing interactions make offsets critical. Are your links so tightly constrained and so close together that you've absolutely got to have really good offsets all the way through? Or is it that you actually can just restrict your cycle times a little bit to keep your queue lengths a bit shorter and then you wouldn't have a problem? So there's a lot of things to consider. When you can't get a common cycle time because your junction designs just conflict, there are options. You can do things like double cycling your sites. This works really well with pedestrian crossings next to junctions. Um, you might be able to move your site into a different scoot region. So if it's on the edge of two regions, you might be able to get offsets to one region, but not the other. That, that can work quite well. Um, but essentially though, if you, if you can't really do those sort of things, then you're into having to keep your site within the same region, but run it at an inappropriate cycle time. And that means that where your cycle time requires a much higher cycle time, where your junction requires a much higher cycle time than the surrounding junctions, all of those junctions around are going to be running with lots of wasted green time because they're going to be holding for too long on, on each stage. And conversely, if your site requires a lower cycle time than the surrounding ones, that same problem will happen on that site. Where your junction does need a lower cycle time than surrounding junctions, you can use subregion independence, which is a feature of Scoot that lets you drop a site or a group of sites out of a region into a different region whenever the, the scoop model thinks that it would work. But to be honest with you, you can only mitigate to a certain point by doing that. So realistically, if you can manage to get a common cycle time and design your junction to work within a network context, that's, that's definitely uh, a stronger design. Um, it might be possible to restrict the maximum cycle times or, or to model exit blocking even. That will mean that the site isn't pushing traffic towards an exit blocked area if it can manage to. But to be perfectly honest, when it comes to cycle times that are different between different sites within the same region, you can only ever partially mitigate the problems that causes and it will affect the efficiency of that area. So it's really worth seeing if you can get common cycle time. The next issue is staging and junction staging is quite a big topic, but again, there isn't much time to really look at this in detail. So um, I'm gonna mention a couple of really key things. The first thing is that um, one of the biggest weaknesses of Scoot is when there's lots of demand-dependent stages. When you have a lot of demand-dependent stages, especially when they're calling in frequently off-peak, the Scoot model is going to look quite inefficient. And the reason for that is because the Scoot model will provide a window period, which it consists of the preceding intergreen plus the minimum green. And that period of time has to time off for every single stage. That's how the Scoot model holds a common cycle time across the region, by making sure every stage can run when you need it to. So if you have a lot of stages that don't run, there are a large number of periods where nothing's happening. The system is just holding on a previous stage and it's just running on. And it really can start to look clunky and cause complaints. So really the key when you're doing scoot is to keep your cycle times, to keep the cycle times low, is to keep your stages as low as possible. Keep the fewest number that you, that you can get away with. 
The second thing is when you're writing staging plans, that can be really tricky. So when you're writing a staging plan, and for those that aren't, com aren't familiar with this, it's, um, it's worth just pointing out that the way that this really works, the crux of it is that when you receive your reply bit back from the site, it has to match to the force bit that you sent once that interstage is timed off. So the reason that this is important is because if you have demand dependent stages and you ask it to say go to stage two, if that stage is not demanded, it won't do that. So you have to say to it or stay in A. So you're constantly having to provide lots and lots of options and alternates. And that can get really complicated when you have a lot of demand dependent stages. So again, keep it simple in scope. I'm going to work through a couple of examples of this because it will make it clearer for those who aren't familiar with writing scoop plan lines. So this is a nice simple example. Um, what we've got here is stage one in Scoot is the revert stage, the name stage. Um, so it's going to run every cycle. So we say to it in Scoot stage one, run control with stage A and it will do that every time. No problem, no messing, simple. In Scoot stage two, we say to it run control with stage B, but that's demand dependent. So we have to also say to it all stay in A because it might not run B. And that's fine again, it's already in A so it doesn't matter. Same in stage three, really. Scoot stage three, run controller stage C, or return to controller stage A. It works because you're always butted up against the stage that's always going to run. So that's what I mean about plan lines and, and making sure that you provide the alternates. Where it gets complex is when you have more than three stages, especially if they're not demand dependent. So in this example, very much the same as the first one for stages one and two. In scoot stage one, run, run stage A, the, the revert, and in scoot stage two, run controller stage B or stay in A. Again, nice and simple. But what do you do when you get to stage three? So in scoot stage three, we now really want to run that pedestrian stage. But if that doesn't run, what do we do? We can't ask it to stay in B because that might not be demanded. And we can't ask it to go to D because that might not be demanded. If we start giving too many options, it gets really, really complicated when you're trying to tell the scoot model what's going on. So this is a horrible um, plan line to, to, to write. So in this example, what I've done is in scoot stage three, I've said run controller stage D because that's a, a busy side road stage. It's gonna run pretty much every cycle. So just, just run that every cycle, keep it simple. And then in scoot stage four, we can run the pedestrian stage or revert back to the main road stage. So when you start looking at more than three stages, you've got to figure out what you're gonna do when you've got that stage that's got demand dependent stages either side of it. And thinking about your staging order there becomes quite important. One other thing to mention with staging order is fixed stage lengths. This is something that not everybody knows and, and it, it can be a common problem in design. When you have a fixed length stage, and in this example here, the stage three, there is an exit ped on that stage and that makes stage three, stage C, a fixed length stage. So the way the scoop model works is four seconds before the end of stage, it makes an advance or retard decision on the stage length based on demand. With this particular site, that right turn into the side road and the left turn out, can't be optimized because it's, it's, it's a fixed length stage. So the only way I can run that is to say to the scoot model, in scoot stage one, run the main road, A, fine. In scoot stage two, run stage C, the fixed length stage, let's get that out the way. And then in scoot stage three, we run controller stage B, which we can have as a variable length stage, meaning we can optimize all of those links that terminate in that stage. So the problem I now have is this site is running, um, a different staging order when it's running in Scoot to what it would do when it was running VA, which can cause a safety problem. Fortunately, this is a Scoot region that runs Scoot 24 hours, so it's not really a big problem unless there's a fault, but it's just an example of the kind of issues that you come up against because the subtleties of Scoot aren't fully understood necessarily. Um, there's lots of other staging issues you might come up against. Uh, prohibited stage changes can get quite interesting. Where you have complicated sites, five, six stages with multiple band moves or via moves, it can get so complicated to build, build plans for them that in some cases I've actually found sites where you, it isn't possible to build a plan when it works. Um, all red stages, these can be a problem. If you have an all red stage to facilitate a via move, that's absolutely fine. You can account for that in the intergreen, it, just ignore it. But where you have a site that dwells in an all red stage, for example, a shuttle where you might want to dwell in all red rather than on a specific movement, you, your model is going to see that as stuck in interstage and it's just going to keep dropping the site as, as a fault. So you have to be really careful when you're, you're designing things like that. You've got to make sure you've got a force and reply bit pair in there. And the other thing that I, I quite like is alternate staging. Alternate staging is good because it means that you are running fewer stages, which in Scoot is usually a good thing. 
But if you've got a scoot link that runs in only one of two alternates, you've only got one reply bit coming back for those two, the scoot model doesn't know what's going on. So it's really important to think around those things. Variable interstages is the next topic. Um, the way that the scoot model calculates effective green for the link is from the stage replies. So the way this works is that the scoot stage reply, the, the, the reply bit comes back from street and it will drop as soon as the first phase in that preceding stage loses green. You will lose that reply bit. So if you've got phase delays and you've got phases that are running on, you won't see that. You'll just see that reply bit drop when the first phase goes down. And likewise, you won't gain that reply bit back until every phase in the next stage is green. So there might be all sorts of different interstages timing off, but you'll only see that one value. So what we do is we adjust for those changes at either end by adding something called start and end lags, but they're fixed values that we input into the system. When you have variable intergreens caused by on-crossing extensions or red extensions, SDE, red lamp monitoring, all that kind of stuff, suddenly you've got a variable value, but we can only enter a fixed value into scoop. So that variability is quite problematic. It can cause the scoop model to start seeing the wrong amount of green, the wrong things going on. So it'll run too long or too short. Um, your offsets are going to be slightly out. Your cycle time is going to be pushed up because we have to account for the maximum interstage that might need to run. So your cycle times can start to get really high. So when you're using variable values, think about the impact that's going to have. And largely that will come down to whether your offsets are, need to be really accurate or not. Um, but it is worth just thinking a little bit around the effect that's going to have on the scoot model. Final topic, scoot detection. Sorry, this is such a whistle stop tour, but time is really tight. When you're positioning scoot loops at a junction, um, it's quite common to simply look at each movement that's separately signaled and provide scoot detection for each movement. But sometimes you'll have multiple links, multiple lanes, sorry, on one link, and they all behave slightly differently depending on how traffic discharges. There might be parked vehicles in one lane that, that affect discharge rates, things like that. So sometimes you actually need multiple links on each individual movement. Um, Another really key thing is where on the link you position your detectors. Um, it's very common for people to say about 100 meters back. It's a good rule of thumb for Scoop, but actually in reality, the way that the Scoop model works is that you want your traffic to queue almost back to the loop most of the time. And just at the height of peak, when it's really congested, you want the traffic queuing over the detector. When that happens, the Scoop model sees during green that there's traffic queued over the detector and it counts that and feeds it into the model as a value and that then acts as a multiplier letting you increase the amount of green time that approach gets during congestion. If your detector is far too close to the stop line and far too far away, doing that can be really difficult and that makes it really hard to balance the way the node behaves during the higher peak. Um, so again that, that's quite key. Where you can't get a normal detector in, there are a lot of other options these days, things like filters and stop lines and reduced detection. Um, they're good features but they have limitations and understanding what those are is really key. There isn't time to go into those, but I've done other papers on those. Um, also using alternative detector types and how those are set up, that, that can make quite a difference. But essentially getting your detector positioning right makes a huge difference to how accurate your scoot model is gonna work. And that will mean that you'll get a bit more out of your junction. So it's really good to get it right. The, the key things are quite self-explanatory really. Put your detector where vehicles on the link aren't gonna miss it. Um, put your detector where vehicles on other links aren't going to clip it. A big problem with this is things like where there's parked vehicles on one side of the road and it pushes traffic across the center line, then you get traffic in the wrong direction passing over your loop. When that happens, you need UD loops and things like that to really make that work well. Um, another really biggie is making sure that you have no sinks or sources between your detector and stop line. Um, if you've got a big side road that's dumping loads of traffic into or sucking loads of traffic out between the detector and stop line, the scoop model doesn't have a clue what's going on. It's counting traffic in and it's disappearing and it doesn't know what's happening. So your green times are going to be completely out. Um, with the way the scoop, work mod scoop model works, it needs uh, five seconds to receive the data from the, the network to process it, make its stage change decision and send that back to street. If your detector is, is six seconds or less from the stop line, really, it's too close and you're not going to get the result. You might as well be looking at historic detection. So that's, that's one to bear in mind. Um, the journey time between the detector and stop line needs to be really consistent. So this is where you get things like zebra crossings and sticky out bus stops between your detector and stop line. Anytime you've got a bus stop or a pedestrian crossing the road, that journey time changes radically and suddenly the scoop model is completely out because we put a fixed journey time in and that we can't change that. So that's really, really problematic. And as I said earlier, traffic should only queue onto the detector at the height of peak. 
So that is a massively whistle-stop tour of um, Scoop um, and, and what things will help you. But essentially, when you're designing your junction, look at things like cycle times. Is that going to work well with surrounding junctions? Do you need multiple offsets or do you need one really good offset? Is your stacking space a problem or can you just constrain your cycle times? Is your junction staging appropriate for Scoop? Are your interstages suitable where you've used variable values? Is your scoot detection positioned correctly? Ultimately, scoot will work no matter what you do. You can, you can provide solutions to most of the problems within the scoop settings, but getting it to work really, really well is so much easier and you'll get so much more out of your junction if the things that I've just explained are, are set optimally. And finally, the scoot and mover requirements vary really significantly. So when you're designing a junction, know what your end form of control is gonna be before you start and it will help. So I hope that's helpful for people that aren't that familiar with Scoop and um, please do get in touch with me if you want any further details. Thank you very much for listening.